Welcome. Welcome to the fifth annual Commonwealth Commercial Land Forum. Got a good crowd today. I'm nervous because I think I know too many people in here, and they have too much on me, uh, particularly Mike Broughton. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce someone, uh, our little special treat here. This is somebody that Mark Claude has been uh, involved with. I'd like to introduce Dr. Boyle, who is the professor and director of the Virginia Tech uh, program in real estate. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin and has been on the faculty of Virginia Tech since 2005. Dr. Boyle is an economist whose specialty is estimating models that reflect how characteristics and market conditions affect values of real estate assets. He chaired the faculty team from six colleges and that collaborated in the development and approval of the program in real estate in May of 2013. He is now leading the program's implementation that has grown from nearly 60 students, 60 majors in the first year, and will have about 15 graduates in May of this year, next year, excuse me. Just a comment, um, I think some of the people in this room have participated with or contributed to formation of this school. I think some of the attendees may even have children that are in this School of Real Estate at Virginia Tech. And I'm sure many of you will consider hiring them. Uh, Dr. Boyle answers directly to the provost, so it's an independent program. It's not part of any one school. And I think this program is absolutely terrific. I will just make one comment. Uh, in 1971, I, I, I went to two years at a junior college, and I applied to VCU. They just started their uh, real estate program. And uh, I was going to be a day student, and I had some great connections. I had pull. I was turned down. Um, <laughs> Dr. Boyle. I don't know whether that was a pitch and you want to come to Virginia Tech now to, to close the whole circle. But I'd, I'd like to thank you for having me here today. I'd like to thank Mark Claude and Commonwealth Commercial. They've helped and supported us from the very beginning. And this program really came about because some people from your industry came and, uh, and talked to me and said, Virginia Tech has some really unique assets. And if you could pull those assets together, you could create a program that's different from all the other ones in the country. And that's what we've tried to do. We're unique in, in a number of different ways. It's an undergraduate program. There are undergraduate programs in other places, but most of, most of them are um, at, the, at the graduate level. So there's a need to add more undergraduate programs. Mm -hmm. When you look at your industry in mo most sectors, the median age is mid-50s, and, and it's an aging um, professional population. And so you, not only with the masters, but you need the undergraduates coming in. The other thing is, as we look at real estate from the whole cycle, from the initial conceptualization, design, planning, permitting, construction, management, sale, whatever your end goal of the real estate asset is. And with that, we bring people from six different colleges together. We have civil engineers participating, architects building construction, lawyers, planners, economists like myself, property managers, and we really try to integrate that into a whole. And that's the breadth that the students get. But we also require depth. And the depth is, is we require our students to double major or major and minor in another area. 80% of our students that we have right now are double majoring. So they'll get a degree in real estate and they'll get a degree in finance, property management, building construction, marketing, a number of, of different areas. And so what we're trying to do is produce broadly trained students that really come out and they're ready to hit the, hit the road running, taking maybe much as 18 months or more off of your training. I made a presentation in Washington, D.C. the other week to the BOMA um, Policy Committee, and they said at 18 months I was way too short. It was more like three years that we would be taking off that learning process. And so what we're trying to do is, is, is try to put students out that are job ready for your industry. They can come in, they can hit the road, the road running, and they'll be, they'll be the future leaders of the industry. And we're trying to engage you in our program. We have 
faculty from the university and university, uh, I mean industry people in the classroom. We bring students out into the field. We brought two students up to meet with crew in Washington, D.C. last week, and we're really trying to have an integrated program with the industry. So I'm glad to have an opportunity to, to be here and kind of address you. I'm going to be here through the rest of, of the day, and if you want to have ask questions, feel free to come up and talk to me. We also left a brochure out at the desk where you checked in about the program, and we also left some pens there, and they all have our website on it, so you can um, check us out on the web. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Boyle. Again, this, is, uh, this year's topic is chaos, disruption, and opportunity. And while I'm going to go over some of the housekeeping issues, uh, I will tell you, in picking this topic, it's been very fun. I've been in meetings with some of these, or jointly or individually, and the, the areas of agreement, but the areas of disagreement, and trying to figure out where we're going, uh, I think is a timely topic. I hope that it will be a lively topic. And let me start off, though, with the uh, housekeeping issues. Time is valuable. You have their bios. I'm going to make some comments about the companies, but then we're going to jump right in to all the chaos. Our panelists today, first of all, is uh, Brooke Smith with Troutman Saunders. Uh, they're an American law firm in the 100 law firms. They specialize in five core areas, business law, energy, industry regulation, finance, uh, and litigation and real estate. They have over 600 lawyers in 15 offices throughout the, uh, the United States and China. As they also have offices around the country. They have 128 lawyers named the best lawyers in America. They've secured more than uh, 15 uh, band one chamber U.S. designations and distinctions in the country. Uh, they have a reputation for excellence and the Environmental and Natural Resources Group offers one of the most comprehensive, and this is Brooks' specialty, offers one of the most comprehensive and experienced law practices in the United States. With more than 30 lawyers skilled in virtually all aspects of environmental and international environmental issues, uh, including natural resource management, compliance, uh, eco, uh, ecosystem markets, sustainability, and one of the things we found out it's kind of an entrepreneurial flair. He is definitely, Brooks is definitely trying to look for upside opportunities in a very difficult regulatory environment. I'd like to introduce, and we've drew a distinction between the initiators of risk, which is J.B. Gurley with Markel Eagle, and I know Brian Kornblau's here, welcome, uh, and Dan Schmidt, who runs H.H. Hunt. These guys are the ones out there initiating and committing the capital to risk. But equally important are the professionals that they employ to help give them advice and commentary and challenge their ideas to figure out what is the best course of action. Uh, Dan is president and COO of HH uh, H. Hunt. Uh, they have a big vision. They want to improve the world in the context of how people live by creating a meaningful experience in places of great distinction. Uh, they have accomplished this just not by building places to live, but building a better way of life. It's a diversified firm started in 1966. They have over 1,700 employees. Uh, they're located in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, and they have built thousands of homes. I know we know them well. They have developed uh, thousands of apartments, over a dozen master plan communities. They, one of the newer areas they're into is they've developed uh, and operate 22 assisted living communities and own and man, as I said earlier, own and manage over 8,000 apartment units. In addition, they do manage uh, golf course and country clubs. Uh, they're in a major growth mode with ex aggressive expansion plans across all of its divisions. So they have become a trusted partner in every phase of people's lives. They've achieved this by living their vision each and every day, and they take a very long view. Uh, our next 
panelist is, a, is Vince Nader, who is a partner with Kiter CPA. They have a 35-year history. Kiter is the largest independent local CPA firm in Richmond. They have 75 CPAs and over 140 staff members. It's an independent firm. They can, Kiter can closely address uh, the growth and the needs of its privately held clients. They are a full service accounting firm. They do more than just real estate, even though we're probably hammering on the real estate and the tax implications. In 2013, Kiter launched a niche site focused on serving the real estate sector. www.realestate-cpa.com. Little plug there. Um, the next person who uh, I've known since childhood is Galen Layfield. Uh, Galen Layfield. He is president and CEO of Zenith Bank. Zenith was founded in 2009 by a group of experienced local bankers with a specific strategy of creating a significant Virginia bank focused on the middle market commercial uh, and real estate developers and investors. They're full service, but they're regionally focused. They're not a community bank. They're not a national bank. It's a specialty. Zenith is headquartered in Richmond and has offices in Greater Washington, Hampton Roads, part of the Golden Crescent. They began business as the 78th largest bank out of 110 headquartered in Virginia. And today, four and a half years later, they're the 35th largest bank in the state. Their combination of capital, experienced bankers, and local decision making have allowed the bank to attract customers and grow in a challenging economic environment. Our next panelist, Michael Joyce. He's the founder and president of Joyce Payne Partners. They've been in business for 20 years. They're headquartered in Richmond and have an office in Pennsylvania. They serve clients throughout the United States. They manage assets in excess of 580 million. They serve as a personal CFO for individuals and families who require personalized, customized, and innovative financial advice. Our next participant, who is an initiator of risk, is J.B. Gurley. He is a principal with Markel Eagle. Markel Eagle is a real estate private equity firm jointly owned by Markel Ventures and the principals of Eagle Construction, both of whom have been in Richmond forever, and we know them. This group, though, was founded in 2009. They have approximately $100 million in assets. They invest directly with operating partners in opportunistic and value-added real estate assets located in the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeastern U.S. Last person, Bill Barnett. Last but not least, this is a person I've done business with my entire career and uh, has been terrific. Bill is um, the senior vice president partner with Commonwealth Land. They have a 20-year history. They've quietly grown over 20 years to their current size of over 90 employees, headquartered in Richmond, with offices in Hampton Roads, Nashville, and Jacksonville. And they've been on a roll. Besides being active in office, retail, industrial, and land brokerage, Commonwealth Commercial also provides consulting, property management, hospitality management, and buyer acquisition services. Most important, Commonwealth Commercial and its family of companies are independent, allowing it to grow around the needs of their clients and do the whole within 22 states. Uh, okay, let's get to the chaos disruption. I asked myself a question, and this is about them, but I just wanted to set the stage. Um, I assume we've had chaos and disruption throughout all time. Is this, particular, is this time different? What is the context and nature of disrupt, disruption and chaos? I would say the discussion that we've had is that things go faster the rate of change and the rate of information. We've had huge demographic shifts. I understand right now that the millennials are just slightly larger than the baby boomers. We've had, for instance, cloud computing, which has accelerated the dissemination of information so quickly. 
Uh, we've had, uh, you know, from, from Salesforce, or Salesforce or Evernote, Amazon. We take it for granted, but we use it all the time. You've got online, online education. It's putting tremendous pressure on colleges. Some are doing the massively online courses. Some will be eliminated or restructured. You've got the Khan Academy. You've got uh, K-12, which is owned by Michael Milken. You've got a lot of changes taking place in the educational world. Healthcare. Look at the biotech park here in Richmond. Look at VCU has done. How much of our downtown in the Richmond area is being driven by VCU's presence? We've got HDL, one of the many companies that are flourishing in the biotech park. We've got genetics the replacement organs that are now just starting to come to the surface, custom drug treatments. My son, for example, is going to have to have his aortic valve replaced. We are, have our fingers crossed that they will be able to do a custom valve replacement as opposed to a mechanical valve or a pig's valve. You've got robotics, the da Vinci surgery system. You've got changes taking place even in agriculture with the mechanization of GPS-driven farming, all the other biotechnology being brought to bear on it, ultimately I think you'll see robotics replace much of the, the, the physical labor in agriculture. You've got search, Google, Monster. And another thing that just segues back into the, what we're doing is a shift in um, home ownership. It was 69%, I believe it's down to 63%. I hope these gentlemen will comment on that. Uh, the rental market has taken off. Um, I think part of the home dream may be waning. I don't know if it's permanent or not. But the implications to us are tremendous. Who wants to start up a big box anchored shopping center? Maybe get J.C. Penney, Sears, where we can't get Circuit City. We could get a Barnes & Noble. Do you want to use those as your lead anchors in the day's market? That is changing for many reasons. That's part of the disruption. The old language, bug, virus, mouse, news group. Bring your own bottle. Today, it's massive online courses. Bring your own device. The cloud, podcasts, the language is changing. Our smartphone is the thing I take most for granted. I am so dependent on it, and I've just scratched the surface on apps. I'm going to give you a hypothetical. 2007, height of the boom, a couple thousand acres, Chesterfield, zone for mixed use, heavy proffers, major infrastructure requirements, a lot of, lot of debt. The bottom falls out. It goes back to the bank. The proffers are impossible to comply with. I'm going to start off our hypothetical uh, to get the dialogue going, but I hope that we will have uh, an intense dialogue, disagreement. Obviously, a person could say, you know, I beg to differ. I respectfully, respectfully disagree, or I think you're dead wrong. My wife always says to me, Sydney, what were you thinking? Now, I'd like to think that she was actually curious what I was thinking, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid it was a pejorative, and I'm applying this to this group here when they challenge each other. My response to my wife for many years is, you don't understand. Now, she thinks of that as condescending, but actually, I just want her to empathize with me. Please disagree. Let's start off the conversation as both the instigators and the managers of risk who wants to address this difficult situation of a 2,000 acre project? Well, I've got one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this on? Um, I do have one of those. Um, that, uh, that we are going to be, um, that we have been having this, this very uh, debate over the last number of years. It's, it's not, we're not ready to bring it forth yet. We're not ready to solve the problem yet. Um, but you know, I think um, I think you have to look at you have to look at it completely different than you, than we looked at it ten years ago. 
Um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we did development completely different than we're doing it now. When we developed uh, the Wyndham community, uh, I think we, we had about $42 million that we put in the ground before we saw the first nickel back. Um, probably never do that again. Um, turned out well, we had financing, but, um, but projects like, like, like what you're talking about, Sydney, they have to be completely repositioned. Um, you have to look at the infrastructure different. You've got to match the infrastructure now with the revenue. Um, and the challenge here is with these zone projects, you've got to go back and rezone them. And, and uh, like I said, we've got one that's zoned. We own it. Um, your Roseland is one of those. Uh, 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 there's a lot of challenges. And so, but what has to happen is, is the professionals have to come together. This includes the, the people on the public side and, and we, uh, you've got to roll up your sleeves and look at things differently than we did before. Densities are, are going to be different completely. Um, we would redesign a, pro a new project today completely different than we did 10 years ago. Uh, higher densities. Um, higher densities are much more acceptable now. Um, greater open space. Um, much more uh, focus on, on active adult. So it's... Um, there's just a whole lot more to it now um, in terms of, of making each phase stand on its own because I don't think you can develop 2,000 acres anymore um, unless, unless it's sitting there with all the utilities. Um, it's, um, you have to look at it piece by piece and uh, you have to match the revenue with the, infra with the infrastructure. Well, JB, you like buying those projects after they went down. We like to make money, though. Well, how, how do you make money? I mean, you, Broad Street Village was somebody else's problem, became your opportunity. Well, I mean, you, to, we can talk about that. I was going to just kind of echo a little bit of what Dan said about you know, large projects that have, you know, they were planned with, uh, on the basis of expected demand, right? So there was an expectation for a level of demand that either didn't materialize or the financing uh, that could be that patient and that low cost uh, evaporated. And to Dan's point, when you have significant upfront capital expenditures that are required to you know, take an asset off the ground, if you will, uh, it's very difficult to recoup that, especially in our business model, which is IRR driven. We, we want to generate our returns on a five to seven year holding period. <clears throat> when you turn to West Broad Village, the advantage that we had there as we came into it was a lot of that capital had already been expended. Uh, had been expended by the previous developer uh, who had borrowed from you know, a consortium of banks that I bet 75% of the people that signed the loan documents from the lender's perspective never saw it. Um, <clears throat> and so from our perspective, we were able to take advantage of those investments by buying them below replacement cost. And that allowed us to you know, be somewhat patient uh, to take what was perceived as risk, both by us and certainly in the marketplace, uh, and be in a position to not have to, as Dan's uh, speaking about, put in all the sewer, put in all the infrastructure. I mean, the roads were there. The, the lots were, you know, not fully developed, but a lot of them were. Um, and, you know, it also played to what we believe is an important component of our strategy going forward, and that's mixed use. Uh, we think that you, know, you spoke, spoke about demographic shifts. Yeah, I think homeownership is, is down. I mean, Fannie Mae's uh, desire to make sure that you know, everybody live in a house uh, in the mid-2000s backfired. Uh, but it also, I think, plays to demographic trends. People want to be able to, you know, young people want to live downtown. They want to live in a dynamic environment. They want to walk to you know, the bar, the restaurant, the grocery store. But you know, my, my friend's kids who are 22, 24, 25, whatever, uh, most of them don't have school-aged children. When they, you know, 10 years goes, uh, goes by and they're now 32, 33, you know, if your choice is $25,000 a year in private school tuition or, you know, quality public school education, 
Uh, and Richmond's very fortunate that it has, you know, a great school system in both Henrico, Chesterfield, and the surrounding areas. Yeah, but schools make a difference. Uh, but that desire to live in a, in a, you know, a community that has some, some dynamics, I guess, uh, we believe will we'll carry forward. And that's why, you know, West Broad Village has been a success, uh, playing to that demographic and to the empty nester. Uh, and that's a key component of our strategy as we go forward. Again, denser, mixed use, uh, and projects that, from a time frame, we, we believe we can be in and out of in a five to seven year time frame. Is this trend downtown permanent? Are people moving downtown? Yeah, I, I, I do. I think so. Um, but, uh, but again, I, I think it plays to a certain segment of the demographic, right? I mean, I don't think uh, 35, 40 year old people that, um, you know, I mean, if, if, if you've got school aged children, uh, it's, it's a challenge to live in an environment that has challenged public schools. Um, that said, I mean, if you live in the, you know, in the Fan or uh, Carytown, I mean, it's a very dynamic place to live, and people are, I think, going to want to be there. I mean, it seems like to me it's becoming more segmented. Uh, the the mixed-use project downtown, the suburban mixed-use, that typically was, you felt like you, the, the goal was to have the single-family uh, quarter-acre lot, and is that fundamentally changing, or is that still a distinct market but being uh, fractured? Well, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a distinct market. I mean, it, it is, it's all, it's all being driven by, by, by demographics. I mean, the suburbs, you hear these um, people saying that they're, the future of the suburbs is uncertain. You know, I don't believe that. The suburbs, quality place to live, good schools, uh, good services. Um, the, the suburbs will always be here, and, and people will always want to live there. But what's happening is, is you've got 89 million millennials. 20% um, of them are living in mom and dad's basement right now, but, but you've, got, you've got that huge population of millennials. They're getting married later, and they're having their first child later. So they don't need to live in the suburbs. You know, they want to be social. Um, they've seen mom and dad struggle with, uh, with the mortgage payment, foreclosures, losing the house. I mean, it's, you know, they've sat by this great recession and watched it. And they don't want any part of it. Um, on the other side of it, you've got um, 76 uh, million boomers. And um, they, they don't want to cut the grass anymore. They, they want to go downtown. So I, I think those two things, um, simply the numbers, the law of large numbers, is driving, is driving the future of the, uh, you know, of the cities. So they're living in a basement. Their parents. I got one of those too. <laughs> I had a young person the other day ask me what advice I could give to them, and I said, "Let me tell you something. You need to be nice to your parents." <laughs> now, Bill, how do you see this uh, demographic? How, how, how does that play out? Well, I'm really curious as to how Dan and JB's firms do the same, do different. Uh, studies to understand those demographic trends um, just because in, in our business is doing your homework and I know in, in Galen's business listening to what they've done with banking I mean uh, a lot of your clients hardly have ever been inside of a bank right Absolutely. I mean so they <clears throat> a lot of his clients uh, bank by the internet so I mean how do you determine the demographics that are going to drive your next project, and then I'd, I'd love to hear how your uh, firm might be same or different. Um, we, do, we do a lot more than we used to, I'll tell you that. Um, we used to think we were pretty smart, and we used to wing it. Um, we used to have some kind of um, uh, basic level market studies. Uh, we have stepped up our game significantly. We. We, um, since this downturn, we have um, uh, invested heavily in our people in terms of education and training. Um, our people are going to conferences all around the country. Uh, they're on leadership panels. I mean, you know, uh, we are, we're investing a lot in our people first, you know, to, because we want our people to be well-educated and well-informed and well-connected. But, but beside that, we are, we are employing uh, market research firms, uh, we probably have five or six right now that we use. 
um, we just have to. Um, you know, we made mis we we made some mistakes going into the downturn because we were way too bullish and we weren't paying attention to the numbers, and um, you know, things just seemed too good, too easy, and, and so we kept doing them. Yeah, um, how does how does uh, going into different products mitigate your risk? You say, Doctor B, you're doing more things, but still dealing with the same issues on the table, maybe more so. I mean, we got the environmental issues, we got the new tax regs. How does that change the game for you? By new products, or you said you're going into new areas. We're good. Can I say, Sydney, what were you thinking? Well, I wasn't thinking. That's exactly right. But by new products, Sydney, are you talking about? Your assisted living, your memory care, right. these areas that you said you were going into. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, for us, diversification is, is huge. Um, you know, and that's, that's the reason we're in home building, we're in land development, we're in assisted living, and we're in, we're in uh, apartment living. Um, had we not been in, in the income producing properties during this downturn, it would have been a bloodbath for us, to be honest. Uh, we didn't have enough cash on hand. Um, that's, that's one big lesson we learned um, that we're remedying now. Uh, but we had, uh, we had a boatload of money in these income producing properties so that we were able to refinance you know, and pull, pull money out uh, to you know, keep the trains running on time. So, um, but that diversification for us is really making, you know, makes the difference. And uh, fortunately, those are areas, I mean, all of them right now, we've got some pretty good tailwinds. Um, good tailwinds in home building, phenomenal tailwinds in multifamily, um, phenomenal tailwinds in, in senior living. So what we're doing is, is we're, we're sticking to our knitting and in terms of managing our risk, uh, there's a lot of great opportunities that are coming down the pike, a lot of them. Um, we are being real careful not to be distracted by some of these, these, these amazing opportunities, but rather we are managing our company so that we're, so that we're kind of um, expanding what we already know. So for, a, we've been doing assisted living for 20 years. Now we're doing uh, memory care, Alzheimer care. Uh, we're getting ready to build our first freestanding uh, memory care uh, community here this, uh, starting this fall. We're probably going to do more of that. We're going to expand into a, you know, independent living. There's just a whole, um, basically what we want to do is we want to stay in the businesses that we know how to run, we know how to operate, but we want to expand it so, we, so there's more customers out there for us. But within a specific define target niches where JB you are more opportunistic driven I, mean, I was going to say I think you know none of us would be so imprudent as to make investment decisions absent you know, detailed market information and, and having you know a good understanding of the of the basic fundamentals but you know information's available to everybody it's it's not hard to come by I've, my partner and I were uh, talking you know for years I worked for a company where we spent millions of dollars on our research department um, we had guys like, you know, the professor from Virginia Tech, as I'm sure educating, that were, you know, brilliant guys. And that was a, that was a real advantage for us. You know, today, literally on the Internet, I, I pulled up so that I didn't look dumb in front of all these nice people here today. Uh, and read a few stats just in case I needed to reel them off uh, in, a, in a pinch. But it was amazing to me the amount of information I could gather. Now, look, there, there's information that we monitor, that we look at closely. Uh, that helps guide and inform our decisions. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's what you do with it also. I mean, I, I might look at, and, and we did, uh, high vacancy rates, uh, a soft office market, and see not turn and run away, but an opportunity. Uh, at, in the same vein, you know, okay, what, what does it mean that the young folks would rather live downtown and they get married, you know, like I did in their 30s and have kids uh, when they're in their late 30s or early 40s. Well, okay, that, that's, I think, also a part of what says, yeah, downtown's a strategy that works, uh, but it also says to us that, you know, I don't know that there's a report that we would read that would tell us this, uh, but it says mixed use is a product that we like. Uh, we look at the shift in demographics, as Dan does, and, you know, there's smart guys, and 
uh, you know, we react in some ways that are the same and in some ways that are different. I mean, I think, you know, you can't be uh, blind to the fact that you know, folks are getting older, and there's a lot of them, and that, you know, from 1945 to 1960, more babies were born than any other time in their nation's history, and there are folks, if they're still alive, uh, that don't want to mow the grass, uh, that, you know, may be interested in having, uh, you know, a, a, a more dense, but they might also like a, a smaller product. Are you product, are you product driven? As it relates to, no, I mean, across our investment platform or not, we're, we're look, I mean, Eagle is a, is a home builder and, and we think a, a really, really good one. And we're proud of the business that we're in there. Uh, and we think that we have some phenomenal capabilities there that, you know, create investment opportunities for our fund business. And so we have a lot of our investments tied to the strength of that, that part of our platform. Um, you know, and I would say that, you know, look, there are other guys in our firm that can speak more eloquently about Eagle's strategy. But, you know, to me, uh, and in the, the simplest of terms, we like mixed use and we like age-targeted uh, amenitized communities. Uh, we think that those two products, A, a the age-targeted, okay, you don't have to be in the very best school district. Uh, so that helps, you know, I mean, look, if, if, if Dan and I are competing for the same 20 acre site in Henrico County, we're looking to build product that's pretty similar, uh, that's going to be sold to folks that, you know, want to go to Deep Run High School or whatever, and that's going to be pretty, uh, you know, you can, you, you can get, a, you, that can be commoditized. We you have a shorter window, and you've also told me that you are almost specifically identified in title risk entitlement risk opportunities absolutely as a possibility I know like Brooks this is the whole issue of entitlement regulatory issues don't how do you manage that type of risk on entitlement both the the getting the zoning but also the the whole sea change in the environmental issues the, the mitigation the this whole VSMP thing that's coming down the pipe how, how do you identify that I mean, you know, you can look at, uh, there's a fund advisor by the name of Cherokee that raised four or five billion dollars in the 90s, and their whole strategy was, was brown fields, gray fields, and, you know, tapping into guys like Brooks and uh, smart engineers, and, you know, their idea was they'd go to urban locations, buy the old, you know, bumper crumbing facility, and turn it into, a, you know, apartments. And, and it worked, and, you know, and they're still around, and it's still successful, but you know, in a market that softens, that's probably not the product that you want to have because you don't have much margin for error. Your costs are going to be higher. Um, you know, when we look at entitlement risks, we think it's the opposite. It gives us the opportunity with, with speed. Uh, in other words, we have a pretty flat decision-making process, right? I mean, it's not, you know, running up the flagpole to uh, the committee of six, to the committee of three, to the guy that makes the decision. We, we can make a decision pretty quickly. Uh, and in markets and where we operate, is that is, is the egg timer going off? Or am I done? No, there's no egg timer. But I, I, I hear you about the entitlement risk. I've talked to Brooks enough. You know, this issue. Uh, I mean, to me, I'm seeing personally some serious issues on the horizon of any degree of of certainty about what it is you're getting when you're. Now, I'm assuming you're maybe going contingent, Look, but people have Institutions to will take development risk all day long. They, they think they understand it. They think that they can hire engineers. And so a fully entitled piece of land that, you know, the Avalon Bay is going to build apartments on or that Camden's going to come in and build apartments on, that land is worth a lot more than the land right across the street that has all the same physical characteristics that's not entitled because they don't understand that. Entitlement is a local game, right? I mean... The, the, the fact of the matter is you have to understand the, the broader plan of the county or the locale that you're working in, what their motivations are, uh, how your strategy or your plan for that piece of property fits in or runs counter to, to that municipality. I know talking to Brooks, though, with respect to entitlements, it, regular, the, the, the zoning issue is local. But the, the, the part of the environmental issues goes way beyond the local. You're dealing with uh, the, the DEQ and the Chesapeake Bay issues and Absolutely. the state and the feds. Brooks, tell us how you And that's see why it. smart guys like Brooks make a lot more money than just us guys, <laughs> right, Sam? Whether you're succeeding or not. Whether I'm successful or not. I, I regret that what you, the audience, will hear from me today is mostly heresy. 
which I hope you'll ascribe to me and not my firm or my profession. Um, but I've spent 18 years burrowing through the dirt like a worm, seeking that blind sun moment. And I think that um, most of what we do is identify impediments, overcome impediments, obtain entitlements, and move on without really thinking about um, whether there's a, a different way to, um, it's really re rethinking um, environmental as a cost uh, to environmental as an opportunity. And I think the example you raised of you know brownfields developers who identified low cost, high risk brownfields properties as an opportunity to invest, uh, get the land, turn it around, develop it, at a lower cost um, and create a niche market out of that. There are still major retailers who are making a mint uh, focused on that niche market and they know how to do it. Um, I think to Sydney's point, um, for many years that the traditional model was uh, you gotta get the entitlements, you gotta click the box uh, for EPA and the state and the local governments and uh, hopefully you're successful in getting your entitlements. The problem is in this new, uh, more active phase of the world, uh, the, the, the regulatory burdens uh, are progressively um, more difficult and we're not gonna avoid them. They're, they're uh, in some market sectors, a proverbial train wreck. It's just getting harder and harder. So um, there has to be some new way to rethink um, in my in my world, environmental issues, so that you're not just thinking about how to overcome the obstacle, because um, at some point they're so inexorable as to be impossible to overcome. But rather, where is the opportunity? Where where can you? You talk uh, about like mitigation, uh, uh, wetland uh, banking, uh, nutrient credits. Things. Right. So there's definitely people in the audience who do this for a living and can speak to this more eloquently than I, but. Uh, new uh, water regulations, so-called TMDLs, affectionately known as too many damn lawyers, uh, really have changed the, the watershed and the landscape in the Chesapeake Bay, among many other watersheds around the Commonwealth and country. Um, for most regulated parties, that's an impediment and a burden. How do, how do I comply with this new world order? But you have uh, entrepreneurs and bankers who have found opportunities to create, uh, using land to create credits that are saleable and marketable and maybe a piece, of the, a piece of the package in development. And that's, that's very exciting to me. You know, Dan said that they're, op uh, they, they're optimistic what they see coming. But then you hear the naysayers say, we're at the turn uh, or on the precipice or potentially another bubble. Uh, Galen, you have to lend, you have to make underwriting decisions uh, and Michael, you're sitting there telling people, how do you see they're making these decisions? You can invest with Markel Eagle. That's, uh, Hunt is a private company. Nonetheless, all of us are trying to make investment decisions within our portfolio. You're, having to make, you're making huge decisions on where to risk the capital of your uh, depositors. How do you, are they on the right target? Is there, is there a cliff coming? Well, I, I don't know, uh, Sydney, if there's a cliff coming, but and, you know we've talked a little bit about some of the demographic uh, trends, and certainly you know the, the, that's very powerful. I mean, the the baby boomers have in, in the United States have transformed our economy literally since they were born. Every, every decade, they've 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 changed some things. But sometimes, when you're looking at investment in real estate or or even other times of investments, you have to look at the trends, but you also have to look at you have to look, look at the investment. You have to look at the deal structure. You have to look at to see what makes that what makes sense. I, I know, in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, you know, I, you know, everybody's looking at all these baby boomers and, and going to going to retire. And I think that um, you know some, um, you, know, you know, some operators thought you know that that all the baby boomers were going to go into assisted living when they reached the age of, of 65. So we had a, a great deal of of supply out there. And right now, in some of the distressed debt markets, some of the you know some of the best um, uh, well, it depends how you look at it. Uh, some of the some of the the greatest supply of distressed debt investments is 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 in uh, some of the uh, assisted living paper that's that's out there right now. So um, I, I would say that we're you know opportunistic, but you have to look at things like the deal structure. You have to look at things um, like valuation. Um, I, I, if you um, if you pull up um, slide, I think it's slide 25, um, you'll see um, 
this is um, this is what I love. I mean, I love I love Bloomberg charts. So if I can make Bloomberg chart exciting to everybody, that'd be great. But the the one thing I want to point out is that top line uh, on on there is uh, is apartments. You know, so apartments have have uh, multifamily has outperformed everything else. Going and and this chart goes back 10 years. So. Um, and, and by far, um, I mean, it, we don't have this on here, but the hospitality sector um, would, would, would be the, uh, the, the lowest, uh, uh, it's, it's done the most poorly over that sector. But somebody like Neil Amin might say, well, that's pretty good because I can go out and, and, and buy some things at some better valuations right now. But we look at these charts and say, well, you know, are, are there still good valuations to be had in multifamily housing? I mean, multifamily was a great deal, and we invested in some deals in 2009 and 2010. And I look back at those and I say, wow, I wish we put a lot more money. Yeah, into but now those. you've got, I understand, 6,000 multifamily uh, multi units in the pipeline. You still as optimistic? Galen, you still underwriting this stuff? We are. Um, that said, uh, we worry about the fact that there are an awful lot, particularly in the central business, business zone, an uh, awful lot under construction. Um, so, so we think about, you know, how do you mitigate that risk? Um, and it's a, it's a function of uh, quality of the developer, uh, amount of equity in the deal, uh, sort of price going in. Uh, and back to looking at, at deal structure and, and thinking about all the demographic trends that we've been talking about. Uh, diversification is important. So, but I think the question that's, that's sort of interesting, I was listening to Dan and JB talk about so the opportunities they, they see, and there certainly are a lot, in, and you look at this, these charts right here, um, you can sort of see over the last few years the recovery in the real estate world, right? Um, so when do we make all the same mistakes, notwithstanding how smart we've gotten, you know, and the demographics that we use and the models we use and all that kind of thing, when do we make all the mistakes again that we just got through making in 07 and 08 and 09 when we all thought the world was going to come to an end? Um, and, and who's thinking about how we manage that, that whole group of complex interrelated risks so that we don't repeat the sins of the past. Are we going to have, I mean, I know that's a $64 question, but I got to tell you, is that what keeps you up late at night? The, the issue of you've got uh, basically free money from the Fed. You've got debt that's piling upon debt. It's uh, the underwriting standards are in certain aspects getting easier. Absolutely. Uh, how do you want to play the game? Well, I think you have to be in it. Um, and, you know, and we are, but I think that, um, don't want to overdo the slides here, but look at number 12 here just for a minute. You know, I think we all are going to be a lot better served. Uh, that's, I think that's 13. How about 12? Yeah. We're all going to be a lot better served if, if we collectively, both the banks and we're the, you know, we're the, what are we, the mitigators? as opposed to the instigators? Yeah. No, we're the managers. Oh, yeah, right. Um, and mitigators. Well, mitigators. Yeah. The and managers mitigate. risk is you mitigate them. Um, and, I mean, you wouldn't believe how much time we spend about this sort of mundane stuff that's on this chart. And it occurred to me that, I mean, we think about the things uh, that are listed there under the banks. Those are all the different categories of risk. Look at the, in many cases, the exact same ones exist on the real estate side. There, there are a few differences. We don't have much construction risk in the banking business, um, other than we lend to developers. Um, on the other hand, you, you don't have probably the degree of operating and technology risk we have. But the rest of that stuff um, are all the same things. And the problem with them is that in many cases, they all come home, or two or three of them, come home to roost at the same time. Um, I think interest rates are a particularly interesting question as we sit here today. Uh, so, so our, our thinking is around um, how do we comprehensively think about the risks, don't let them get in a silo, you've got to think about them all in an interrelated function, um, and then we think about what are our shareholders, which of those risks do we get paid to take, and which, ones of those, which of those risks are we capable of mitigating. We think we're pretty good at underwriting credit. We can make mistakes, but we think we're pretty good at it as long as we don't get carried away. Um, 
Some of the others, uh, interest rate risk, interestingly enough, for a bank, you're talking about cheap money and, you know, we can talk about Washington and what's going on up there and spend the rest of the day about that. Um, cheap money is sort of a risk for us. Um, so, so we try to be agnostic about interest rates. Um, we can't control them. We can mitigate them. How many, how many real estate investors today are taking interest rate risks because interest rates are low and I'd rather pay a variable rate than pay a fixed rate, in a high, which is going to be a higher rate? So a lot said about risk. I think it's a really complex question. Uh, at the end of the day, it gets back to how much capital and how much equity do you have to have so that you can, you can withstand the inevitable cycles that are going to occur. Let me, if, I, if I could, if this works. Does it work? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you asked what we do, right? So your, your question, as I took it at least, and I think the way Dan and I answered it, was what are your activities? What are your current activities? Where do you make investments? Um, and that was really the answer that I, that I gave, and I think the one that Dan did also. You know, if you talk about our perception of the market, where do we see risk? What's our strategy going forward? Is it the same, you know, in 2015 as it is today, I would say that, you know, we're, we're cautious. Um, look, I mean, there's no doubt about the fact you're, that... You're cautious, we're, but you're, you're, you're accelerating your growth. No, that's not, that's not, not. entirely accurate. Uh, and, and certainly we're diversifying our investments so that, you know, we're, we believe, uh, trying to provide some, you know, some level of thought and, and, and care to the investments that we make. Look, prices have gone up on land. We're... we're we're surprised, I guess I would say, in some respects, by the speed with which land prices have increased. Um, you know, I, if, if you ask no. me about the housing market, then I'll say, yeah, I think it's, it's still strong. I'll, you know, it's certainly not as universally perceived as phenomenal as it was two years ago. And, you know, look, seller expectations, you know, drive a little bit of what we do and where we go. I mean, it, and some of that may be let me frame this as a practical problem. We want to make an investment. We want to make an investment in real estate. Do I put it in land? Do I buy a share of Mark Hill Eagle? Well, that's obviously what you do. And by the way, <laughs> do, my partner's by the door, a so just I mean, come on. Am I protected? Uh, if there's a bubble, will I be hurt as bad as the last time? Do you have it better mitigated? Do you have it better managed? Am I going to have the same downside? Because I feel like now if I put invest money, I'm at this peak again. Prices have accelerated. Interest rates are totally improperly priced. It's distorted. We're not paying the real cost of money. Am I not set up again for the whole scenario uh, and the tax implications, both long term and short term and the whole? Am I really going to, at the end of the day, come out with a good deal making an investment with these guys? Let me take a shot at that. Um, first, uh, to Galen's point on the uh, on the multifamily, I think the we will overbuild. There's no question. I mean, that's that's what we do. Um, <laughs> right. 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 I mean, we are humans, and that's human nature. And so we will continue. I feel at to do home that. now. But um, but I think I think the metrics that we've used in the past are going to be different going forward because because I do think that we are shifting toward a, a rental based society. Um, um, home ownership is come down from almost 70 percent down to. I think you said 63 percent. It's, it's definitely below 65. We we see that continuing, and um, you know, you know, how low that's going to go, we don't know. But it's going to go low, lower, um, and that's going to result in the need for probably 350,000 to 400,000 apartments per year, every year for at least the next five so years. So we're not overbuilding. Not yet. No way. No, you know, maybe in maybe in select markets where everybody is there, um, yes. Um, but for the most part, you know, we are choosing markets to, to develop apartments in that we believe that there are some barriers barriers to entry. Um, that um, uh, there's still plenty of uh, of space uh, in that market for us. Does this Aiden embedded uh, about the interest rate deduction on home ownership. Is that going away? You know, the whole tax structure is shifting around, Vince. Yeah, the, um, the, the title of this uh, uh, forum is, is pretty dead on after getting through this last tax season, uh, the chaos and disruption. Um, the, when we first heard 
a 3.8 percent, the tax rates were going up. It caused a little bit of uh, thought about how we needed to plan with our real estate guys and what we needed to do. But as we worked through this tax season and uh, guys that made similar money to last year, they're paying significantly higher taxes. It was uh, quite chaotic. And um, now when I hear 3.8 percent, I break out into a sweat because everybody was getting hit pretty hard. And so now finishing this tax season where it was the first one under the higher tax rates and, and some of the president's budget proposals and uh, potential tax reform that has taken you know, mortgage interest and uh, like-kind exchanges and uh, rehab credits and all sorts of things, either reducing them or, or uh, eliminating them, I think has significant impact going forward on so, uh, so it's promoting uh, apartments, speaking of what Dan said, and it's undermining long-term home ownership. Plus, to, it's tougher to get a loan, or not necessarily so. Well, I don't know about that. Um, it, I think it. I thought I think, about thirty-some percent of all home purchases yeah, yeah. are cash. I, th I think that is true um, as it relates to sort of traditionally underwritten mortgages, government insured, and so forth. The underwriting criteria are tough have been tougher, and and they stay that way. That said, um, it's a great time. If you're a real estate developer, it's a good time to go get a loan. I mean, the banks are killing each other, um, which is always an indicator of things getting to where, you know, it probably doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah. Huh? I said, we don't really like that. We would well, rather that not. Is, we like it when it's tough. Well, yeah, but you're PE, right? You're, have, you're private equity. Of course you do. Yeah, I, well, right. Um, but, you know, it's an, it's an indicator. Um, I mean, Dan, you got to be loving the banks these days. Come on. But a little bit. You know, a little bit. You know. Yeah. Uh, I can't say those words. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I would disagree. The the A and D loans are not um, you know, are not readily available. I mean, we've got we got twelve, fifteen lenders we deal with. Uh, the home building side, um, you know, uh, they love it. You know, uh, they love us. You know, they want to give us. Uh, uh, they want to increase our lines every time we see them. Uh, so that part of it. And so what, what we're having to do is we're having to almost force them to take a, um, a spoonful of um, development loan with some of these home building. Um, because, you know, they're, the, uh, the acquisition development uh, financing uh, isn't coming back with a flurry just yet. I, I mean, they're still, uh, they're still risky. You know, and, then, and then we do a lot with HUD, yep. you know, on our income producing properties. And that's, um, that's a whole different ball game. But that's, that is, um, that is, fairly available yeah, uh, to val us. Very valid point about the land A, a and D. I mean, it is, it is, in the bank's view, right or wrong, far and away the most risky segment in which to be involved. If you look at the last downturn, uh, that is where, uh, I think for the most case, the developers and the bankers really uh, were hurt badly. Um, it's, a, it's a focus, not as an excuse, it is also a focus of regulatory oversight in the banking world that that's, remains pretty difficult. So um, you're right, that, that, that part's tougher. That said, um, there's some deals getting done, takes a lot of equity, um, and the terms are not as, as uh, agreeable as they were certainly in the, in the 05 to 06 time frame. But tell us, I mean, uh, are are you telling people to invest in real estate to the same degree, or are you changing the allocation? Oh, no, we're, we're, we're still, um, we still think that real estate is an integral part of, of really all of our clients' portfolios. It's going to look, it's going to, the composition of the real estate portion of the portfolio is going to look a b little bit different. But overall, I'd say we're bullish. You had asked earlier, Sydney, I mean, what could go wrong? And, well, there's always something that can go wrong. But, I mean, one of the things that, that we look at um, as at, a little bit level of concern, and Galen talked about interest rate risk, and, you know, they're, they're a little bit agnostic. But I look back, you know, that, um, that in May of last year, May of 20, 2013, the 10-year Treasury note was at 1.61 percent. And, and um, by the end of the year, it was up to 3 percent. And, you know, now it's in the 270 range right now. But... As those rates, which are pretty significantly higher than where they were last May, cap rates have not really come up during the, during that period of time. So this would speak to some of the valuation things that we had talked about a little bit earlier. And and I also want to make a quick uh, comment. Well, I don't know how quick it is, but but 
I don't know if I agree with Dan about uh, us, uh, about um, you know the United States anyway becoming more of an apartment-based uh, society. I think that's been uh, that's been a big trend. But if we pull up slide 26, um, we see um, some uh, a, a slide from our friends at J.P. Morgan. Um, I, I learned when I was in grad school that um, it's not called stealing when you like something. It's it's called benchmarking. But if you look at that uh, that that slide on the, I mean that chart on the uh, upper right hand side, the home affordability index. I mean ho housing is more um, is, is, is I mean this speaks to the supply side in the housing market. Um, you know affordability. It's more affordable than it has been in several decades. And the, the, the lower chart shows that there's, you know, home inventories, you know, while, while they've started to recover a little bit, um, are, are, are down significantly. Um, I think, I don't have a chart on this, but real estate, um, I, I think uh, new home building is still at a, at a several decade low. And if, if you look at the demand side, you know, household formation uh, is, is likely going to pick up. I think Dan's son's going to move out of the basement at some point in time, and and he hopes. and uh, he, he he hopes and 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 certainly some uh, the household formation has been uh, uh, from the start of the Great Recession till late um, well, probably into 2011. Household formation was negative um, or at at the very least very flat during that period of time. And you know, but the population certainly wasn't flat during that during that period of time. So we believe that there's going to be uh, an increase in household formation um, at at some point. I, I always get away with saying, you know, interest rates are going to go up at some point. So you know, even if it takes 10, 20 years, I, I'll still be right about that. But um, but the but we do believe that household formation is going to going to going to improve the demand side of the equation um, in the housing market. So overall, we are. You know we're, so, we're 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 positive. Are you telling people to invest in land, which used to be the you would buy land and you would use it to pay for your kids' education? Or are you telling people to buy a share market? Where do you tell people to put your money? Well, it depends on the deal. Uh, but um, you know, um, and and yes, we 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 have told people to put put money into into uh, Markel Eagle. Um, you know the 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 um, I mean the one thing that I love about any type of investment is distressed investments and. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, real estate is not as distressed in most in most sectors in most markets as it, as as it once was. But there are still opportunities out there. There's there's, there's I mean to say there's not opportunities in the multifamily market um, either. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at the marquee markets like New York and Miami, I mean, those are just out of sight in terms of their uh, in terms of their valuations. But there's other markets, you know, that there's that there's uh, that there are opportunity and. And uh, you know these, these are the types of markets that have geographic nuances. These are the types of markets, um, you know, they're they're not all the same. They're not they're not homogenous. So so we have to take that in, in, into account. But but we, we are going to be mainly looking at at uh, at, at the valuation. Um, you know, the raw land piece is not going to be an area that is going to generate a lot of cash flow. And I do love cash flow um, in in investments. But it can be it can be a, a great opportunity. We. Well, um, Bill, do you, do you agree with that um, as far as land as an investment? I'll tell you what, sure I do. Uh, now, it's got to be properly structured, and we look at it on a transactional basis, and we look at, you know, what it is, what it could be when it grows up, and what its competition is, meaning other parcels on the market or what else sold. But, I mean, I think the Golden Crescent in Virginia is as fine a place to be as there is in the United States or maybe on the globe. Why? Because... I like it better than Miami, and I like it better than New York. <laughs> but um, if you'll pull up slide 10, we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of that particular marketplace. And, and you're right. It's not cash flow driven. It's more by you know, preservation of purchasing power. And uh, what we see here what is- What kind of what kind of land is this, Bill? All right, this is rural property. So it's gone uh, from 1,000? Yes, yeah, this is uh, a period of time that starts in 1999, ran through the end of last year, 2013. 
100 acre transactions, arm's length, 30 counties, Central Virginia. We do 50 counties, but this is just to keep the trend line the same, same 30 counties. All right, you saw it go up in terms of average price from a little over 1,000 an acre in 1999 to 3,000, level off, and then it's declined until the low of 2011, and now it's begun to recover. But look, it's just over $2,000 an acre, so it's still off by 30%. I thought I'm being told that there's so much pressure uh, the lack of money the government has in the whole road, the world of infrastructure, their non-compliance on downstream, on centralized uh, uh, utility systems, the, the inability to fund future roads, their shortage of money. Does this really play to the land long term, or is it a play in land for different kinds of uses? Oh, for different kinds of uses. I mean, um, first of all, this is a commodity, and from a, a developer's perspective, and this this is raw material. Uh, it's out in the country, and none of these tracks that are measured here have water and sewer available to them. But if we go to the next slide, or maybe it's the previous one, where is it? Uh, was that 10? I want to go to 11. Uh, the number of transactions, the marketplace that we're in is volatile. I mean, in 1999, we had approximately 250 transactions, and it fell. Uh, I think I can read it here on the monitor, 137, back up to around 250, fell in t uh, 2009. I mean, your, your market fell to the bottom in March of 2009, if I recall, and then we've worked our way back up to a little over 160 transactions of that particular category, 30 counties, arm's length, 100 acres or, or larger. But um, that's still uh, not a robust market in terms of the number of transactions. Now, what would you do with it? We go back to Brooks and we find out, hey, I don't like government interference and I don't like what's being pushed down from Washington, but you know, if I'm gonna be compliant, what's the opportunity there? One, if I go to Vince, I'm thinking about timber, which biologically, if it's loblolly pine, has a growth rate of five to 8% a year. You can store it on the stump and then you have the transfer from pre-merchant to fiber, pulp wood, chip and saw, and saw timber. We're beginning to see maybe saw timber finally come out of the basement because of construction. And, and maybe that's, and really what we're all talking about is how do you see around the corner? How do any of us predict what's gonna happen next? You don't want the, the money flush because your deep pockets and equity then have competition. But when on a transaction side, we always thought, I don't care what this land acquisition is, if it doesn't have a financing contingency, it's not going to close unless there's financing. There may not be a financing contingency in that document, but without it, it's not going to happen. I, and I, I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm betting. Possibly. Okay, uh, it's it's Maybe. strong likelihood that I'm wrong, but you asked me to go out on a limb, so I'll do it. Um, if I look at the dates there, Galen, would you say that those dates with the greater transactions correspond with pretty strong banking years? In other words, if I were going to ask you about, hey, what are the lending standards in 2006 or 1999 pre-dot-com bubble? Pretty, pretty loose, aren't they? Absolutely. So that, uh, so that goes to, to your point relative to the, f the financing of the transactions. And, and look, I mean, we use, we use leverage. We're not, I, I, I hope the banks are healthy. I hope that leverage is available. But, you know, when we talk about instigators, mitigators, look, a, a, a sound lending strategy, uh, careful underwriting on the part of the banks, that's all good news for me. I, I think that's great. Um, when, you know, I, I look at conduits coming back, for example, on, on commercial real estate. Okay, there are rules where they can't sell the B piece and the originator needs to keep 5% and, you know, things that Dodd-Frank has, has, you know, instigated, which theoretically will keep, you know, the Bear Stearns of the world from coming back and, you know, having the same interest rate and the same underwriting on you know, a shopping center in Farmville, Virginia, where I went to school or, uh, you know, Long Island, that's, you have know, two miles outside of New York City. And, and by the way, they're different risk profiles. They shouldn't be the same. Um, so, you know, it, those transactions take place and it's different, right? I mean, you, you pointed out some of the investment opportunities uh, that can be derived, but some of that's lifestyle and some of it's just a, a nice, safe but place it, to put money. Absolutely. Because it doesn't keep track with inflation. We, and we talked location, location, location. It was one of the questions coming out of the audience. But that, 
What is location now? Is it, is it more back to infill? Is it more back where there's existing infrastructure? Can you still rely on future expansion of infrastructure where you tell people to park their land? I hope it's good for agricultural and timber. It may not of be course. in the path of development. And where are these guys buying? You're doing, he's going back in the city, you're buying. Who's going out into the green I, I'll, Let me say this. The, somebody that is really smart, and it's not me, but I heard Sam Zell say one time that the only time he's in favor of development is, for, is in the face of pent-up demand. I think Dan's point in apartments, there has clearly been pent-up demand for apartments. Uh, there's been a demographic shift that's led to that. Um, and you know, look, not much got built. When you talk about the demand for homes, though, I, I do think it's important to look at, I don't know that a lot of 28-year-olds, 32-year-olds, or in my case, 54-year-olds, saved a lot of money between 2009 and 2012. That's kind of an important point if I'm going to walk into Galen and say, I'd like to buy this lovely home that Dan Schmidt or Bud Oley built, unless I'm going to write a check for the entirety of it, which 30% of the people are doing. I can tell you, that's not the 32-year-old uh, that's, that's you know, been working for 10 years, in, in most instances. It, it might be. Uh, but, you know, they work for Hunt or one of these guys. I, I don't know. But. Do you agree with him? <laughs> yes. Um. I'm sorry, he agreed with me, Sydney. Yeah, I know that the uh, whole goal is to have us disagree, time. but uh, don't let that happen. I'll again. try not to. I try not to agree with Hampton Sydney guys. Um, so, you, so wait a minute. So, so Dan, you're telling me because you would invest. That, that's smart. You would invest in their model. No. Uh, <laughs> he said no already. I mean, he knew the answer to that. Absolutely so that was, that not. Was, absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> absolutely not. That's um, true. Beside the fact he's a Ham Sydney guy, right. um, um, which, uh, which we'll lay that aside. You know, we, we um, our model is more, um, more predictability. You know, and, and, the, and the, the Great Recession for us is probably the best thing that ever happened to us. I mean, it really is. I mean, it is, you know, I don't want another one. Um, <laughs> Not for a long time, but we are a far different company than we were in 2004, 5, 6. Um, we're Isn't that kind of like saying surviving cancer made me more spiritual? I'm, I'm possibly. Not, I'm not. Possibly. But, you know, we are, um, you know, we used to do these big, these big deals, um, long-term deals. Now our deals are three to five years. You know, we want to see the finish line. So do our lenders. Um, you know, we're able to predict that with greater certainty. Um, we're far more disciplined in our, in our analysis. We're far deeper in our market research. Um, we now have an investment committee that every deal we do you know, has to go through the, the gauntlet of, of, um, of a lot of analysis. Um, so, so we are, to your point earlier, um, your question earlier, you know, um, what is the risk you know, of investing with you guys um, versus, versus how it used to be, now that we're back? Um, I, I think we're far more disciplined. Um, we have an investment allocation model now. You know, we make sure we put, you know, I think we put 38% of our money into apartments, 34% into senior living, 8% um, into land development, and the rest into home building. I mean, so, so we are, you know, we have a, we have an investment portfolio uh, that we're trying to manage you know, with our, you know, with our. Um, I assume your loan to value ratios are your have greater equity involved in every deal. Uh, that's right. That's right. And we have, we also have very strict hurdle rates now uh, with with everything we do. Um, we have a um, minimum rate of return on every single deal. You know, going into it, you know, and we have to have a very high confidence that we're going to achieve that. Uh, but JB, that, you have the same that. thing, don't you? But what they're doing, they're doing a little bit more of a, a gunslinging, I think. I, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, and you know, and and good for you. I mean, I think I think we need that, and and you know, you know, and that's risk and reward. And chances are, you know, when you hit those, the return is very very high. You know, we are, we have become a probably a little bit more of a boring. Developer in terms of of um, uh, of our model, you know, and um, uh, we're sticking to our business lines. Do, do expanding. you calculate IRRs? I mean, is that how do you how do you underwrite? Like on a HUD apartment, you're going to own that for 40 years. If you right. do land development, I mean, that's. I, I guess what you're saying is you don't buy 
to hold with an infinite time frame anymore. Is that, is that the difference in terms of the shift in your strategy? Well, no, I mean, we look at, we look at holding everything at least 10 years. Um, and most everything we hold longer than that. Um, but um, well, how does that compare to the three to five year? Is that where you want to meet your threshold return? Even I was going to say, well, as a gunslinger, I kind of like to be able to exit. It seems to me that if I look at the transaction, I'll go up bill slide. I don't have one that, that portrays it. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it might, the, the Joyce Payne Partners guys, I, I'd probably go off this, but we, we find it works pretty well, too. It's buy low, sell high. Now, you, you, you can't always do that, right? But how do you mitigate against that? Well, you know, I'll, I'll speak about commercial assets for a second. You know, when we buy an office building, we focus almost exclusively as one of our key metrics at replacement costs. What's the, how do you know that uh, rental rate growth is going to stall? Take a look and see cranes. If, you know, the, the, the easiest way to know that uh, rental rate growth is, is nearing its peak or, 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 or stopping is the fact that rents justify new construction. Today, you know, rental rates need to be in the $24 to $25 a foot range to justify new suburban construction. We kind of like being able to buy at 16 to 18 bucks as our estimate going in, run through the lease up, and then be able to sell, you know, when they get to the 24 to 25. Let the other guy underwrite 24, $25 rents growing at 3%, and we're a happy seller. Now, you know, look, it, the whole point, I guess, is to have it be lively. If we're going to take a 10-minute break and people are going to go upstairs and check in and go to sleep if we don't say something that's, you know, provocative. And so I appreciate Dan saying that, you know, look, I, I, I think that it is a sound strategy. I, I, I will say to you that the thing that I found really You think it's better than his? Say it again? You think your strategy is better I think they're than different. I mean, you know, I, I think you could be different and still be, you know, successful. I don't, if, if we all did the same thing, A, we'd be like lemons jump, jumping off a cliff, and B, life would be pretty boring. But I want to deal with both of you. Huh? I want to deal with both of you. Yeah, yeah, I think. I, uh, I want to deal only with Dan or only uh, with Markel. Uh, well, he can get tickets to Randolph making basketball that's games, so there's a real plus <laughs> there for That's because you. you get a commission from both. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, right, part of our business is transaction, right. you know, it's contingency fee, but we do a lot of fee for service, and that's where most of our growth has been, or else we wouldn't be in Nashville and Jacksonville, Florida. But, uh, but I, th I think you're absolutely correct. Maybe I interrupted you. No, you no, no. I, all I was going to say is that, look, we're, we're IRR driven. It's, it's a sound strategy to be very patient. We think we're patient also. We're patient within a five to seven, perhaps 10-year time frame. That's what our investors expect. That's how we structure our business. And, and you know, it, it's not unique. I mean, we didn't create it out of thin air. It's, it's, it's a model that's fairly well, uh, well founded and historically has been successful. What has also been successful is, you know, buy it, hold it, own it, be patient, and you know what? That, that works also. That allows you to have great locations that are, weren't a great location necessarily when you bought them. I mean, it, in, in 10 years, that's a great thing to own. You know, there are a lot of folks that make uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of money who are very, very successful, who are very, very patient. I, I'm not critical of that strategy at all. It's just not the one that we employ. And Sydney, um, if I would clarify, you asked the three to five years. What I'm referring to there is really the land development side. Oh, okay. um, I mean, the, uh, obviously our, our apartment living and senior living portfolios are much longer than that. We, you know, we've got 1,200 employees in, in the senior living part of our business. So, you know, and that's, and that's healthcare, you know, that, that's a healthcare business, you know, it, it, you know, it's real estate for a little while, but then it's healthcare for a long while. It seems like one of the distinctions here is that it's, you, an, it's an operating business. I mean, if you ask business. somebody yeah. that owns hotels, their business is a business that's housed in real estate. Their location is important. Their replacement cost is important. All those are factors. They've got ongoing capital. That's an important right. component of their underwriting. But, you know, there's a really smart guy here that, that makes a, a good living in the hotel business, and what he'll tell you is most everything in that hotel room every five years has to be replaced, and a bad guest experience is a problem that you don't want to replicate. So, you know, it's, it's every night you're, you're starting from scratch, and the apartment business is a little bit like that. Every year it's another reset. Um, I have to say from uh, 
from an investment standpoint, I, I, I definitely like a more finite uh, time frame. Um, I think our clients usually like to hear, you know, less than 20 or 30 years. And, you know, th uh, and, and exits are always good if they're, if they're um, you know, if, if they get a good multiple of return on the, uh, of, uh, on the exits. So um, I, I think that's a very important, uh, a very important factor uh, for us. And we do also believe in diversification. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think, Dan, what you guys are doing is, is smart to be diversified because we don't know what's going to be what, what's going to be the next hot thing. I mean, I, I think we'd all like to think we 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 are. We can make some educated guesses at this, but 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 we don't know. Galen doesn't know when he's underwriting it. I mean, we n none of us none of us really know. So, you know, we're all a, a little bit. Uh, we take the chicken way out by kind of covering our bases, you know, and 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 getting in, and getting into and getting into a lot of different areas. So, as investors or, or and as people who who um, who advise uh, investors? You know, we certainly want to be diversified, not not only across the different real estate sectors, but we're also going to have geographic diver diversification. Let me, let me ask everybody a question here. This is all great. How does the we've had our entire careers bubbles, cycles? I would say the debate is they're potentially more volatile and less predictable. Take a position. Where's the next bubble? I, I understand we're, we're diversifying, we're hedging our risk, we're trying to underwrite properly. You're building certain products with a brand identity. You maybe are a little bit more opportunistic driven, but each within, you're trying to diversify, but that's with an assumption of a non-bubble event. How, what, tell me some scenarios of bubbles that we need to think about where that next, next disruption can take place, free for all. I think we're able to see the most leverage you know, whatever sector you see the most leverage going into. Galen? Well, they're by nature unpredictable, but, but sort of. You've got that, to do scenario that, analysis. Well, I know, but that, but that said, um, you know, we worry, we, you know, we worry about interest rates. I mean, I know that, you know, Fed funds is 25 basis points, and, um, but at some point, we're 10 years now into a really low interest rate environment. Is it properly priced or improperly priced? It's completely improperly priced. So what happens? Tell me what the politicians are going to do in Washington. I mean, uh, who knows? It, but at some point, the laws of economics, I believe, will, will prevail, and, and we will see a rationalization of the cost of money. And when that happens, interest rates will go up, and I think when they go up, they're going to go up fast. Will that play better to multifamily than single family? Um, better to multifamily. No, I think it'll hurt, you know, sort of real estate across the board. Rents, rent, the uh, apartments have the advantage of they adjust rents every year. That's so true. In an inflationary yeah. environment, they're a phenomenal investment. Even though in the last bubble, people doubled up. People went back to their parents. I mean, you still have that. That was amazing where you had apartment vacancy spiking up due to this uh, elasticity that was taking place. Right. But the, but the more the higher that the, uh, the rates go up, it's going to um, uh, lower the affordability, and that's going to help apartments. And you know, I think, I think our society already is, um, uh, is looking at apartments differently than they have in the last 40 years. Um, we have renters by choice. Um, and um, we have young renters by choice. We have old renters by choice. We've got Gen Xers that rent by choice. They want flexibility. They want convenience. They want to be um, in great locations. Um, you know, and, and we, along with a lot of other par apartment developers, are changing the product to be more um, long-term housing. I mean, we have we have concierge services now. We have, you know, it, it, we pick up their dry cleaning. We, we pick up their trash. Uh, I mean, it's like living in a fine hotel. And so. That's what I do. So. Pick up the trash. <laughs> so, so a lot of these people aren't going to move out, um, choose to move out to a place where they've got to paint and, uh, and, and, and so cut it, grass. It plays, it plays to that. And I know Galen has talked about. Uh, this whole mispricing of interest rates. Are we properly assessing the regulatory risk? I mean, 
It's driving me crazy. Is it just something you should adjust to and make it too big of a deal at, or is it really going to gum up the works? Are we underestimating the, uh, the unfunded uh, pensions, unfunded liabilities of localities, infrastructure issues, downstream compliance on sewer, uh, the whole wetlands issue? Are we underestimating that, or is that something we just will adapt to and it's no big deal? I mean, my perspective from the environmental standpoint is that we are, as I said earlier, hurtling toward uh, regulatory train wreck. And right now we have smart risk managers that uh, are available to all of you uh, to try to keep pace or outpace uh, the regulatory train wreck. Uh, there is a point at which that uh, train wreck occurs and your choices of development investment uh, will be inexorably changed. And if the Bay watershed, for example, becomes a new growth market because you don't have the utility infrastructure and you can't, can't get the entitlements to develop in the Bay Watershed, then uh, these smart market demographics that you're following uh, are not going to be met. And so I think the, not to be Pollyannish about this, but there is a moment of convergence where smart people look out a little further ahead and crystal ball the train wreck and say, are there opportunities uh, to, to, to avoid the train wreck altogether? And use those market demographics to pick uh, precisely those areas that are going to be uh, most ratcheted by the regulatory environment, uh, but build in a way that you can uh, overcome those impediments. And what's, I think the, what's the timetable on that on that train wreck? I mean, <laughs> can we can when, we see it coming? Yeah, can you tell us when? I mean, obviously out? you can hear it, yeah. uh, but but when do we see it? You know, and. Uh, it's just on water and stormwater uh, within the next 10 years. You know, this conversation has been focused primarily on the development industry, mostly housing, because everybody's got to live somewhere. The demand for office and retail has been pretty anemic. In fact, a lot of that's contracted uh, since the downturn. But for the average person in this room, uh, I think most of you are in a position of I don't think Social Security is going to be enough. I need to save more, and that's not good enough. I mean, we're balancing uh, interest rates on the backs of savers at such a low rate. There's no advantage there. So you got to become an investor. Where do you put your money if you don't want to or can't invest with, you know, a private firm like Hunt or Mark Hill? I mean, can you just go buy something yourself? Is it a single-family home? Is it an apartment project? Is it a small yeah. retail complex? Well, you know. Vince, you're in that business of managing people's affairs. You see it from an accounting point of view. We have the backup to one of the higher percentages of our government uh, constitutes of the, of the GDP. Tax rates are going up, the 3.8%, the ordinary rates, everything's going up. How does it play out? I mean, is this something, again, how does this alter people's ability to invest? How does it alter how they keep what they've invested in? Well, it certainly um, impacts both of these guys that are hands deep and Bill even, you know, how much they can reinvest and all those sorts of things. But I think um, Galen makes a really good point about until um, you know, the president and Congress and all those folks make some decisions on where we're going for the next 10 years, um, all these questions you're asking about, you know, when's the train wreck and where should you invest and where's the next bubble, um, I think is almost impossible to answer until they've kind of put some things in stone on but don't so, your customers ask you? Uh, absolutely, and we what can only answer based on them? based on what we the information we've got now is all we can do, and the, the enacted what, what you, tax code. But what do you say? Well, I don't tell any of them where to invest. Uh, they come to us. These guys are extremely. You fix their problem. Way more, way smarter than I am, and 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 know they're neck deep in what to invest in and where the uh, where the cash flow is and what their investors want. But I think they both have you know completely different pressures, you know, Dan has his shareholders that he's answering to, and it's prob probably a smaller pool of people that he has to answer to, and JB has maybe hundreds of people that he's answering to because he's got investors and, and different pressures on where they're putting their money, and our, our advice to both of them is maybe completely different based on whether they're making money, how much money, are they losing money in the first few years, it's not, it's not unheard of, uh, so our answer may be different depending on are they making money? When is when is their exit strategy? Is it five years or are, are never? You, are you worried about cap rates? Are you worried about interest rates? What's worrying you, Vince? Uh, all of that. But what worries me is 
what's going to be repealed, what's going to be extended, what's going to be long term. Uh, uh, if, if you go to uh, slide 18, it's a sampling of some of the things that are in um, the president's budget, uh, proposed budget and some of the tax reform, uh, the draft tax reform stuff. And you could pick any one of those and if it goes one way or the other, completely changes probably what all of us are doing. If they, you know, r repeal the historic rehab tax credit, I think it, it impacts probably multiple people that are in this room that make their living out of doing that. Um, you know, the 1031 like kind exchanges, people may or may not sell something if they got to pay tax on it instead of exchanging it. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation right now for uh, some of the, the, the tax guys that help advise on structuring, et cetera. Are, but these, are these higher tax rates slowing the velocity of transactions? People say, I normally would sell, but because the rates are higher, I'm going to hold longer, even if it's, they're almost making a tax decision as opposed to an investment decision. There was at an absolute, prior to some of the expiration of the lower rates back in 10, 11, 12, people were saying, well, higher rates are coming. I'm close to retirement, I'm close to exit, not quite where I want to be, but they were definitely exiting to take advantage of some of the lower rates. Uh, and I'm sure now as people have gone through the shock of uh, higher rates, all, all the, the, you know, the 3.8 and, and all the other stuff, yeah, they're absolutely making decisions, uh, not completely based on the tax, but certainly it, it, must be a, it must be a consideration, especially when you've got if you're making money and you've got to pay out cash flow to pay the taxes, you're paying out maybe 40%, 45% now instead of 30 or 35%. So you have less to keep in the business. So it's a an absolute consideration. That's capital formation, and that's a very difficult issue. But look, how many of you folks here would want to stand up and say, I have confidence in Washington, D.C.? Will anybody stand up? Somebody stand up. I mean, somebody, huh? There's some folks <laughs> maybe a back. federal employee. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know. And What's happening on Capitol Hill right here in the city of Richmond is not very inspiring either. Uh, so uh, was it Sam Zell? You mentioned him. Someone like Sam said, I don't even think about, uh, maybe it was the, the head of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, said, I don't think about political decisions because I can't read them. I mean, it's, it used to be not transparent. It's opaque. No, it's become a black box. Something goes in and something comes out, but I don't think any of these issues are going to be resolved. I don't think it's going to be, I have no confidence in my lifetime, if I live a long life, that those issues are going to be dealt with in any way except in a political brinksmanship. So diversification, Harry Hunt has always been a man of discipline, and you've exercised that in your business. You, get to, you really can keep it internal, so you can make, a, in a certain respect, respect, make a much longer decision, be more consistent, be more disciplined. In that sense, you do have an advantage, but nobody can invest with you. Right. Yeah, well, but, I mean, but Harry says the best, the best idea wins. He has all his companies out there, like his children, with their mouths open, the birds in the nest, saying, <laughs> hey, <laughs> feed me, feed me. Uh, and so you've got to make your next project better than whatever it is for the capital distribution for that year. That's right. And, I mean, you're competitive within your own firm. You've got the same discipline, I bet. Well, yeah, I, I, there are just a couple of thoughts. I, I, we were talking, you asked the question, and uh, we got some of it got answered, but where do you think the risk is? And, and the thing that, uh, as, as we talk about government, look, <clears throat> there's a great deal of uncertainty. I don't think our... Uh, I don't think our government pays for that uncertainty relative to our interest rates in a global economy because we're still the safe choice. How long can we print money and do that? I, I, I don't know. Um, but again, that's un, nowhere near smart enough to try to have that drive an investment decision, but I'd, I'd be blind if I didn't at least have it be in the back of my head. But when you talk about risk, you know, okay, yields are low. so. I mean, junk bond yields are the lowest they've been forever because people are chasing yield. It's so counterintuitive to me that, okay, I'm going to buy, you know, very low rated fixed income securities at depressed yields because that yields higher than, you know, Galen will give me on a passbook savings. So, you know, relative to a risk adjusted return, I, I don't know that I see that. When you talk about uh, cap rates, and there's no doubt about the fact that rising interest, interest rates, uh, are a threat to the current cap rates. But you have to also look at the fact that cap rates today, you know, I, I will say that cap rates 
traditionally are 250 to 300 basis points above treasuries. When, when I started in the business, I went through a training program, insurance company, that's what the chief appraiser told me. It's pretty much true. I mean, if in, in that reading that I was doing for my homework, I read a report from uh, one of the smart investment banks, or actually Teachers Insurance Annuity, uh, did a study of cap rates. And one of the things that they pointed out is that today they're 500 basis points. So you can have a bit of a rise uh, and have compression in the spread that will make you know, the immediacy of that rise in interest rates felt. But this is teachers' insurance and annuity. That's an all-cash buyer. If rates rise for the leverage bar, it makes a big difference. So, you know, look, it... it you, you've got this whole thing, though, of yield. Uh, because it's so low in the bond market, deposits, it, people, are, even of age 65, retirement age or beyond, they're being devastated. They either have to take risk maybe beyond what they should be at that age or get a yield that generates... Uh, they're the ones that have already uh, had the impact of inflation because they can't buy as much. They have to work longer. The whole retirement model, I seem to perceive, as being changed. Is that correct? But you, you, you can't get it if it's not there. I mean, just because you've missed out on, you know, the, gosh, I, I really need to have a 20% return because my investment, my 401K got crushed in the, in the Great Recession. I think it's reducing their lifestyle. Well, I, I, it, it, it does that, but it also, you, you can't, you, you can't get it. I mean, so you can seek, I, I want to have a higher yield, so I'm going to get a 400 basis point or 500 basis point spread on a passbook savings to buy a junk bond. Wow. I mean, that doesn't strike me as being a very prudent investment. Now, you know, Dan, I, I get it that some of what we do is different, and it, and it is. Look, we're, we're driven for IRR, but we try to be pretty prudent about where we take our risk. We're not taking risks that we're not familiar with, that we can't underwrite, that people that I work with or that I partner with, who, by the way, co-invest with us. You know, you're not our partner if, you're, if you don't have skin in the game. And you don't, you're not our partner if you don't have expertise. And you know what? A lot of our investments are pretty much across our own platform. So yeah, we take risks. There's no doubt about it relative to buying, I guess, that junk bond. But boy, I like the risk that we take a lot Yeah, better. and of course, as we know in the real estate world, it, liquidity is not its strongest uh, suit. And then you have, to take, you have to take that into account. I mean, you have to you have to have a reasonable expectation of an illiquidity premium um, when you're when you're when you're making any kind of investment uh, like that. But in terms of in terms of interest rates, you know, um, I, I think that um, that uh, it's they're not necessarily the markets aren't necessarily going to wait for. Uh, the Fed to start raising rates or, or, or tightening monetary policy significantly before they start to go up. I'm, I'm not making the claim that they're going to go up uh, 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 rapidly, um, although they, they really did uh, for a period last year. They, they, they went up quite rapidly when the markets freaked out. You know, they thought Ben Bernanke was going to, you know, was going to was going to pull Dan, the whole, you agree with pull quantitative easing. Yeah, I do. I do. All right, so well, we're. Well, excuse me. Let me add I'm that not too. sure what, about, what are we supposed to agree with. Let well, me. The, about 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 the markets aren't going to wait necessarily for the Fed to start to to, to start raising uh, to start raising rates because number Rate, one rates going up in yeah, advance. Yeah, number one, market, oh, I, I, the yeah. market's yeah. going to anticipate right. this. Number one, they're, they're not they're they're not going to be reactionary to it. And mm -hmm. and secondly, you know, the, the I mean, the rates are just so low right now relative to inflation. I mean, when when I was talking earlier uh, from last May when the 10-year Treasury note was at 1.61 percent, that was below CPI. And, and, and for a short period of time, investors might accept negative real rates of return, but they're not going to accept negative real rates of return into perpetuity. Now, now they, they've risen a little bit uh, there, and, and that's that the, the markets are going to, uh, are going to expect a, a higher premium over inflation. Yeah, regarding the uh, regulatory environment, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, these are all real issues, um, the, um, the entitlements, the tax issues and so forth. But for me, um, you know, I really don't waste a lot of time worrying about them. Um, can't ignore them completely, but, you know, I've got enough to worry about. And, you know, we try to run our business um, as, as well as we can run it in the teeth of the 
greatest demographics that we can. And we all have to deal with Washington and their policies. And, you know, um, almost to some extent, the worse it gets, the better it gets for all, us. All I can say is the state, of Virginia, the state of Virginia has spent $300 million, $500 million banking on a regulatory approval on Route 460, and mm -hmm. they are flushing our money down the drain. Right. Now, who wants to take... <laughs> who wants to... T as we wrap up, tell, tell us... Take a position. Bubble. Next year, two years, is it going to be in the form of rate spiking, regulatory issues, the government's going to default on debt? What kind of just summarize quickly where you see this? <laughs> okay. So. Take a guess. I mean, we're, you're, you're, we, we, we don't know how it plays out, but in the back of your mind, you do worry. Everybody, sure. if you don't worry, I don't want to invest with you. Yeah, but I mean, but to, to Dan's point, I, I think that we, we try to, as he does, focus on taking risks where we can manage the outcome, where to some degree, elbow grease and our back against the yoke can make a difference. Now, you know what, no matter how hard you worked in 2009, it didn't really make any difference. Are we going to see, you know, all, all predictions you know, seem to go from you know, looking in the rearview mirror and what you expect to see going forward. I don't know that you know, any one of us is going to, I'm certainly not going to say, well, I think it's going to be you know, fall of 2015, it's Armageddon, you know, I'm prepped, so I'm okay. I mean, you know, that's not really how we look well, at it. We you, do, you may be, I, we do recession planning um, in our company. Right. And so we, we operate our business on a 10-year ten ten cash flow. I mean, we've got a 10-year cash flow document that we run the whole company. And so that 10 years going forward, we plan recessions. You know, we schedule recessions you know, into our planning. And, and I will tell you that based upon the, um, the economists that we follow and the, the economists we use, um, we just moved our next recession out to 2018. So we, so we believe there's, there's you know, four to five years of a, you know, Kind of a plow horse economy in front of us. You know, it's it. You know, it's not going to be great, but it's not. But we believe it's going up. Thank you for your candor. Anybody else want to take a position? I, I'm going to take a position uh, and be contrarian by not answering your question. Uh, <laughs> my, my position is that for 40 years, industry has been the pariah of of the federal government. The e big bad EPA has gone after industry with full force and authority. I think for the foreseeable future. Uh, the new four-letter word is um, both agriculture and development. And so there's got to be a new way of looking at how to um, use land uh, that, that does not simply go lockstep with regulation. There's got to be a sweet spot where if you're selling a, a way of life or a quality of life um, without um, charging more for it to incorporate um, ecosystem values into that development in a way that appeals to the millennials, that appeals to the EPAs of the world, and that uh, creates healthy markets. And that's, frankly, a way not to anticipate a bubble, but to pierce it. Right. Uh, exactly right. Vince, do you, uh, you recommend, I mean, what do you tell your clients? Well, um, it, dep you it depends on each transaction. And it, uh, my position that I'm going to take is that tax rates are not going down. Uh, based on, <laughs> wow. based on the, wow. based well, that's on going the out of limb, isn't it? Isn't that that's crazy? Sorry, that's, prof that. that's prophetic. That. Isn't that wow. crazy? So you know, you better be prepared as whatever deal you're getting into. Sit down, figure out what the tax metrics work. are, because it's a huge number. So you better be prepared. Bill, my personal crystal ball says three years out. I hope you're right, and I'm wrong, Dan. Um, the takeaway here, I really think, is understand that real estate's not liquid. Uh, if you've got debt, have a plan to pay it off at some manageable basis, whatever your cash flow expectations are, uh, that leverage while it can work positively is also negative, and that's how we usually get hurt, and um, that's happened time and time again. Uh, diversification, none of us are smart enough to know which basket to put it in, so we got to put it in several baskets, and that means non-real estate assets, but if you have real estate assets, they're more than one basket, of, more than one type of real estate product to, to own. Um, I'd like to do something else before you wrap up, though. All right, cool. All right. You know, I, I would say that uh, 
There's not going to be a bursting bubble for quite some time if I had to make a, uh, make a prediction on it. I don't know exactly when it's going to be, but um, I, I mean, I do think that, that we will see um, slower um, growth overall than we've than we've seen for quite some time. That you know the the, the dollar is not going anywhere. I mean, it's it's going to be reserve currency of the world for the next generation at least. Um, so so none of those issues. But I will say that you know uh, I, I had said earlier where where would a, a bubble come from, and it's where the leverage is going to. Um, I would also um, if I if I think back in past cycles also, uh, I, I I think if you look at you know not to pick on. Uh, a segment, but where the when the REITs start paying, you know, just ridiculous cap rates for things, you know, that that might be that might be a sign that a bubble is nigh. Do you do you agree, Galen? How do you see it? Yeah, a um, couple of observations. One is I, I think it's useful to to for for all of us to understand. One of the great things about the banking business, there are not a lot of great things about the banking business, <laughs> but one of them is is that you do get to talk to lots of people in business every day across a broad spectrum. Um, I would just say for, for everybody's benefit that doesn't do that for a living every day, the, we got two risk instigators up here today that we've heard a lot from. They disagree about some things. Their investment philosophy is a little different. I can tell you they're good risk mitigators. I mean, what, I, what you hear is a thoughtful approach, whether you agree with it precisely or not, and they, whether they agree with each other or not, they're both thinking about the issues that are important. And, and for me anyway, that's really the crux of the issue because to answer your question, I don't think any of us know when the next bubble's coming. I don't think we know where it's gonna be. Regulators, you know, that I live with every day, literally every day, um, have spent, you know, a gazillion dollars and, you know, they don't know either, let me tell you. They really don't know. Um, so I think that the challenge is that we do what what JB and Dan do, I mean, and that is we think about and we manage our businesses every day for the inevitable fashion that the risks will come. And in the meantime, you continue to invest and you find the places you think you can make a buck and you keep on doing it. And just my last two cents worth, um, all this mess in Washington, all of that, I would just, you know, and I know you're going to find this really hard to believe as coming from a banker. You know, I'm actually really very optimistic. Um, I, th I believe there is... You know, we are one or two people, one or two great leaders away from turning around all of this stuff that we worry about every, every day from a political standpoint. And if you go back in history and look, it has happened time and time again. And if that happens, and when it happens, the, the that's economic... The, you're saying that's the antidote. That's the antidote. It'll happen, and when it does, the, the economic surge that can occur in this country is going to be unbelievable. Wow, Bill, you were gonna. You had a conclusion. Concluding well, I, I mean, I'm I'm delighted to hear the optimism this is first. Great. Before I go I, to the conclusion, I, tell you, I mean, Gail, I'm surprised. Uh, this is I good. Knew you would be. I, I, knew you would be. I, I tend to be a pessimist, but it hasn't paid off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to be a Republican to think about that, or or a Democrat. I mean, you, the, what's going to happen this fall might create the kind of opportunity that you've described, um, and so. Uh, I just know what my clients look me in the eye and tell me. But there, yeah, there are two things I think we need to do. First, this program would not have occurred without an enormous amount of work from a lot of people, uh, other brokers, our colleagues in Commonwealth land, but really staff. Colleen Warner. Colleen, I think I see you back there. <laughs> Ray Brady, who is standing to her right. Leah Ziegler, who is to his right, and then Roberta Via may not even be in the room. I can't see through the lights, but um, also Roberta Via. Now, there's, there's one more thing. Um, thinking about energy this afternoon, thinking about risk mitigation makes me think about Sidney Gunst and his career and how let me see if I can get this straight now. You've been a cyclist, a kickboxer, a kayaker, yes, and uh, most recently table tennis. High risk. Uh, high risk. Uh, you know, it reminds me of my friends who go from nothing to golf to, t to tennis. But at any rate. Shuffleboard's uh, next. Some, some people say that we have trade with China because of table tennis. Do they use that term, table tennis? If you're good, it's table tennis. If you're not, it's ping pong. Okay. All right. Well, so um, in an attempt to mitigate your risk, 
Uh, <clears throat> we talked oh, to. I have something for you. Oh gosh. <laughs> I had, beware of the bearer of gifts. <clears throat> this is, I am told, a titanium. Oh my gosh. Table tennis paddle. <laughs> now, you have I'll, to I'll, I'll have no further excuses. The uh, significance of this is that oh, gosh. Sydney was losing time and time again to one of his best friends. That's right. So serendipitously, you go to a coach of a nationally ranked player National and, and get coaching. Secret lessons. Secret lessons. And then you come back and whoop up on him yes. time and time again, and he can't understand what's happened to That's him. That's right. And, and only then did your wife Say, Sydney, you have got to confess. She Where said, you got I, she, this she said I was immoral. Uh, for <laughs> she, I, I said, it's just a game. She said, this is immoral to deceive your best friend. I said, it's not immoral. <laughs> I had to tell him. I showed him on his iPad a picture of that. She's the four-time U.S. champion. I said, actually, I'm taking lessons from her. He thinks I'm joking. I had to tell him three times before it sunk in that I had been deceiving him. Open this up and take a look at it. I mean, all of you will be dazzled by this. It's so, locked. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This used to be the uh, you, case God. that the Hope Diamond resided in. <laughs> this is, who's ready? Uh, it's amazing how many people grew up with a table, uh, with a ping pong table in their basement. It's just unbelievable. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's from the Hope um, Thank you. Uh, this has been very fun for me. I will tell you, when they asked me to do this and the topic came up, I thought it was fantastic because I think about these things also. And I'm sure you think about them. And we thought it would be fun to get these experts, developers, bankers, accountants, uh, lawyers, and to discuss what actually dis we discuss all the time. Interestingly, again, in our various meetings and preparing for this, it's kind of the, it's the topic du jour of trying to figure out to make the best possible decisions. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I hope it's been worth your while. Immediately following this, we will have a reception outside. All this information will be on a PowerPoint. Colleen, when? At the end of the week, uh, feel free to Grab these guys after the, uh, uh, this formal part, and please enjoy yourself in the cocktail party, and thanks again for coming. Let's, and let's thank our guys. Thank you.